Um, I'm going to do, what I'm going to do today is completely focus on examples. So just concrete examples of groups. I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to start with the one that I ended the lecture with yesterday and show you why it's cat zero and give you a general feel for how to, to prove something. Well, to show a group is cat zero, you essentially have to find a space, right? Because that's the definition of it is I want to show that my group acts geometrically on a nice space. So the, it's, the examples really come from finding spaces that are cat zero spaces, OK? So I want to put up the example I had yesterday, which was, um, I want to make sure you, I probably am going to use different letters today because I want to do something else with this example. I'm going to use x, y, and z. I think I might have used a t yesterday. And I want to, so I had this uh, commuting relation, and then, then I had one more other relation of length 4. So these were both relations of length 4. And then I started to draw a picture of um, the universal cover of the standard 2 complex. I just started to draw kind of the one neighborhood. What happens when I put on the first edges and the first two cells? That's what I drew yesterday. And I'm going to draw it again. And you'll be amazed at how quickly I draw it. And this time, I'm actually going to use the labels. So I'm going to use colors instead of labels. So there's two colors. I need three colors. Um, let me extend this one a little bit. So this is going to be my x's are going to be orange. And my y's are going to be blue. And my z's are going to be green. OK? So I, I am going to draw some arrows on them. So my x's are going to go this way. And my y's are going to go this way. I do mean I've already messed it up. Thank you. That's what I meant, because I'm going to use t for in just a minute with this same group. And then, so these two cells are pretty easy to attach. I'm going to draw them in white. So the two cells I'm putting here, remember, this is kind of sideways. These are just, this is just a picture of the commuting relations between x and y. That's a picture of all of the cells that would go around the edges that I've drawn so far. All right? And then what I want to do is put in the cells for this relation. So what you're going to have is a cell that comes up, a z that goes, I'm going to have it in this direction. And then it goes, that's the other half of it down there. And the way that it across is, well, I know that when I read t inverse x, there has to be another, or sorry, z, I'm saying it again. When I do the z, there has to be two blues, two oranges, and two greens at every vertex. Right, because there's an incoming and an outgoing. That's why I have six of them around that vertex right there. And the same thing has to be true here, although I'm not going to draw all of them. I'm going to draw enough of them for you to see where the two cells are. Now, on the top of this two cell is going to be a y edge going that way. Right? Z inverse, x, z, y inverse. That's that two cell. Now, I'd have another one of them here with the green edge. Z. What I'm going to have is I'm going to have one like this with the, um, the I'm going to have an X, which is this color, coming out this way. And I'm going to have a Z edge again. So, and there's that. So there's the, so these, and there's another one back here. Harder to draw, but I'm going to try. All right, there it is edge back there, and it has another orange coming that way. Okay? So that's sort of the one neighborhood. Now, what I want to do, so this is just topology so far what I've done. I haven't said anything about metrics, but I've drawn the picture in a faithful sort of way to think like a geometry person. I really want to think of those as unit squares. So in other words, there's a Euclidean unit square everywhere I've drawn one of those two cells. And so, you know, drawing geodesic triangles inside of those squares is no problem at all. Like, that's great. I already have a cat zero metric on those little cells. And the problem is, what happens near a vertex? So for two complexes in particular, it turns out there's a very easy way to think about what the cat zero condition means when I draw a combinatorial object like this. So what I mean by like this, I'll write it up in a minute, is if I glue together polygons, so I'm thinking about things that come from group presentations, and that's basically what you have. When you have a finite presentation, your relators can be read around the edges of a polygon, right? Of some finite sided polygon. So, what I want to think about in terms of geometry is gluing those polygons up along isometries on their edges. 
okay? And when I do that, I build a combinatorial complex just in the way I said, but then I want to think about it metrically by metrizing each of those cells as polygons, Euclidean polygons. And then it turns out that to check the cat zero condition, all I really have to do is make sure I didn't build any positive curvature somewhere at a vertex. And it's that simple. So let me show you how to check it. So what I have to do, so remember every vertex in this complex looks exactly the same. Right, there's six edges coming in, six edges going out, and there's the two cells glued. You can think about just taking that picture and translating it by the whole group, and what I get is the universal cover, right? The one skeleton is the Cayley graph of this group with respect to this generating set, and that's the picture I'm drawing. I'm just putting the two cells in, and I end up with a nice, simply connected complex. So what I want to do is I want to think about what's happening right there at that vertex. So what I'm going to do is draw the picture of the link of that vertex. Okay, so the link is like a little picture of, I stand at the vertex and I look out at just a tiny little neighborhood, like an epsilon neighborhood ball. And what I want to record is some combinatorial information. I want a vertex, so this is going to be a graph in this case. When I start with a two complex, the link is going to be a graph. And the graph is going to look like the following. So this is going to be a graph. And the vertices, are just in one-to-one -one correspondence with the edges at V. So I just count one. We already know there's six of them. So whatever this graph is, it has six edges because there's six vertices. And then the edges of this link are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the two cells that are there. So what do I mean by that? So I'm going to draw the picture of it. So two vertices in this link that means two edges in this picture that are incident at V, they're going to be connected by an edge if they span a two cell in this link, in this picture. All right? So what I have there, I'm going to draw a picture of it, is I have the green, and the, I have two greens, and then I have two oranges and two blues, right? So I have my two oranges, or two blues, and my two oranges. Right, those are my vertices, and I can think, I'm going to go like this. I'm going to say x plus, x minus. I'm probably going to have to move that one. A y, I want to make sure my arrows are right. y plus, y minus, and then I have my z plus and z minus. And the fact that x and y lie in that Euclidean piece, that they have a commuting relation, means that I have a circuit like this in my link. It's not a very nice little diamond, but that's OK. That's good enough. So that loop in the link corresponds to this little picture right here, right? These are joined, these are joined, these are joined, and those are joined. The blue and oranges are joined all the way around in a circle. And now when I think about where the green is joined, well, it's joined with the, this top green is joined with the two orange ones. And the two, and the bottom green is joined with the two blue ones, right? I'm ignoring, I'm just really looking at a very small picture around that vertex. So I'm not, I'm ignoring all the rest of the edges. It's what's happening at that vertex. And so here, we get he's joined to this one and that. That's not, not, it's not the best picture of that graph, but you could draw a more symmetric one. Yes? Do you multiply two cells between the positive green and the negative side? I do not. Okay. I do not have that. Um, no. I think, I've, I think I have all of the relations in there. Am I missing one? I think I'm OK on this. OK, I'm going to give you another picture of this that will help us double check it, though. All right, so that's the link. And then what I, so I've just defined the link as a combinatorial object, as a graph. Now what I want to do is I want to say, what I want to record is some geometric information. So the geometric information I want to record is the angle that, the, that if I make that a Euclidean polygon, then that means there's an angle at that corner, right? All of these are pi over 2, so that's kind of boring. But I did this. This is made out of squares. So all of the angles everywhere are pi over 2. But what I want you to think of is that this is a metric graph where the edge lengths are recording the angle at the corner of the polygon. OK? So think about every one of those edges having a pi over 2 on it. Yes? Can you say what the edges are wearing again? The edges are, so the green vertex and the orange vertex are connected by an edge because there's a 2 cell here. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. OK? And then the condition, the cat zero condition, this is a theorem. This is a, uh, actually quite a big theorem. The, well, the, gen, the most general version of it is a really big theorem. Uh, 
that you can check the, a local condition of, on the links of a vertex to decide when a combinatorial object is cat zero. All right, so I'm giving you the two-dimensional version of this because I can draw the pictures and it's easy to say what that condition is. But it turns out that you can glue together bigger, uh, higher dimensional cells, polyhedral cells or piecewise Euclidean. You can take big pieces of higher dimensional Euclidean space, like the convex hull of a finite set of points. Take finite set of points in Euclidean end space, take its convex hull, that's some polyhedral cell that has some nice com convex thing that has a metric on it. Take a whole bunch of those as your little puzzle pieces, glue them together along isometric faces, and then try to decide whether the thing that you've, make a simply connected one, and try to decide whether what you've glued is a cat zero space or not. Okay, it's just harder to say what that means. But in this, it's quite simple to say what it means. So the cat zero condition, so this complex, so, so a simply connected co two complex um, built, is that the right English, from Euclidean polygons, I'm not wording this completely how you would word it in a textbook, but I think this is the right thing to get at um, in the way that I said, where you're gluing along isometric faces. Um, so regular Euclidean polygons with um, all edge lengths the same. So you could make them one if you wanted. That's what I mean by a regular polygon. I mean all of the edge lengths are the same. So this is cat 0. If and only if, when I go to this graph, I don't have any circuits. So remember, this is a metric graph with angle things on the edges, angle labels on the, on the edges. And what I want is if and only if no circuits of length less than 2 pi. OK? So why is that the case? Well, look at how, when I put, so let me just look at the case where everybody's pi over 2 like it is here, right? So what I would want, in this case, when they're all the same angle like pi over 2, that just is honestly 100% combinatorial. I don't even have to put the pi over 2s. I can just say, I can't have any circuits of length 3 or 2. Because as soon as I have a circuit of length 4, I've reached my, pi, my 2 pi and I'm OK. Does that make sense to everybody? So what happens when I have a circuit of length two, uh, 3, for example? Well, when I have a circuit of length 3, it looks like the corner, it looks like the corner of a cube. It looks like the corner of a cube where I haven't filled anything in. Right? Cuz that would mean I had three vertices in my link and each one of them would have a square joined there. So I'd have like a bottom square, this is my bottom square, my side square, and my front side square. Right? So I should have drawn this one maybe like this and then I have my front side square. And what's the, the problem here is I didn't put any three-dimensional stuff inside of that corner. And so I have a pocket of positive curvature. When I look at the corner of a box like that that's empty, then I have some positive curvature there. And that's exactly what I'm trying to avoid. If I have more than four, that's totally OK. That's actually negative curvature. Right? If I try to, so here's exactly four. Four right angles together. That's, that's the picture we have with the x and y. And if I try to put five, that's fine, because if I try to squeeze five right angles together, it's kind of hard to draw it. But this is what it looks like. These are all right angles now. Then what I get is a little pocket of negative curvature. But negative curvature is non-positive curvature. We're OK with negative curvature. Right? This is good. This is not good. So that's really what this condition comes down to, is avoiding pockets of positive curvature at the vertices. Because then what you do to conclude, this is a pretty strong statement even already. And I should say, you need, you, there is one extra condition on this. So what I want, remember, is a cat zero space in the end. So I want to have a proper geodesic metric space that satisfies the cat zero inequality. So in order to get everything that I just said, I can only use finitely many isometry types of polygons. So I can't glue together you know, infinitely many different types, because that will ruin the, the proper geodesic part. OK? All right. So and of course, it, the proper part means it's going to be a locally finite complex. If I want a proper, if I want a locally compact metric space in the end, it really should be a locally finite. That's how I say that with topology. If it's locally finite, in other words, only finitely many meet <coughs> along a vertex or an edge, then that's good. It's going to be proper. The geodesic part's the hardest part to prove. 
you have to take any two points in this complex and prove there's a geodesic between them. And the way that you do it is exactly like if you were in jail and they weren't going to let you out and they said you have to define a metric. Well, the only thing you would do is you would hope that I would take, I would start in some cell, I would go to some other cell, and I would say, well, when I'm in a cell, I just take the little Euclidean piece and like, then I'm going to take some other paths over to this other vertex. I'm going to maybe have to go through a vertex or along an edge. And then I'm going to look at the infimum of the lengths of all of those paths. I'm going to look at the shortest one. Prove there's a shortest one, and then that's going to be geodesic. OK? And it turns out that all works. Yes? Um, so with the length yep. and then having this like, not, no positive curvature, does that imply that there needs to be a minimum valence on your inlet or draft? Well, so this is the, the finitely many the local finite condition. So I didn't put it in. Locally finite. So when it's locally finite, that will, that will imply that. Or you can think about it as I'm always going to be starting with finitely. A fin think about this as coming from finite presentations. But in, if I just want to think about it pure, purely geometrically, if it's a locally finite complex, that will happen. right? I can't have infinitely many two cells near a vertex to have local finiteness. And therefore, this graph is only going to have finitely many vertices and edges. Okay. Make so sense? Put some bounds. Yes. Yes, that's right. I'll write up a very, very uh, precise statement in a minute about a, a little bit more precise than what I have there. So um, in the statement, the, there are no circuits of length less than 2 pi. Does that mean for every link of every vertex? Yes, here? yes. So every one. So if, um, yes, I mean for all V. So this has to be true for all vertices. Thank you. That's what happens when you don't put up a precise statement. For all vertices in the complex. In the one I built from a presentation two complex, all vertices look the same. So you really only have to check one. That was my thinking. But you're exactly right. I could do something that has no kind of equivariance, doesn't come from a group, and then I have to check it everywhere. Is there a common situation where that's just not feasible to check everything? Well, um, well, so no. So if you're, well, let me put it this way. If it admits a co-compact group action, which is what we want in the end, then there's only going to be finitely many ver vertex types. All right, there's only going to be finitely many vertices in the quotient. So if I have a geometric group action, then when I quotient out, like here, when I quotient, when I, I built the, the standard two complex for this, for this presentation, this group acts on it by isometries once I put this metric on it. I get a quotient object that thing's compact and has this fundamental group. Right? That's basic cover. I'm just constructing the universal cover topologically and putting a metric on it. So, you'll, so you will always have finitely many orbits in the quotient. All right. if, that's kind of the way we're, I'm trying to give you a purely geometric thing, but really I'm, I'm already thinking of it coming from finitely presented groups. So we already have everything you might want. But you're exactly right. If you want to do this without group theory, you have to think a little bit harder and write, and write the correct hypotheses. OK? So does, but is everybody OK with this? That now I could glue hexagons and squares and other kinds of gons together, and then this really becomes a metric graph. Qualities or some kind of conditions that I have to check to make sure that graph doesn't have any small circuits. OK? So that's, um, that's, so this example is a cat zero group because I just constructed a cat zero space on which it acts. And notice what also that gave me a little bit of topology. I started with something that by construction was simply connected, right? I just said, well, this is the standard construction we always do. You take the universal cover of the standard two complex, I get a simply connected topological thing it acts on. Then I put a metric on it, I proved it's cat zero. Now it's contractible because cat zero spaces are contractible. So that's really very a powerful tool in geometric group theory, is when you want to build a contractible space that your group acts on, putting a cat zero metric on it does the trick. OK, so that's another uh, useful tip. OK, so um, I wanted to say one more thing about this group, because just in keeping with the theme I started yesterday, actually, maybe I'll go like this. I think I can move one down and one up, can't I? I want to keep that picture up there for a minute. Okay. So there's another way to think about this group. I can look. So now this is where the letter T is going to come in. All right. So I'm going to look at this group. Um, 
Okay. So this is a group, three generators. I have, I have a z plus z subgroup right here. That's good. Okay, so that's pretty cool. And then I've got this other relator. Right. Oh wait, I'm missing a letter. This is a b. Sorry, I knew I was missing a letter. That would have been a bo more boring group than this one. All right. So I would have had like a just a two. I would have had a what would I have had? T commutes with a and b. I would have had like f two cross z if I did it that way. So I've changed it now, and I put the a b there. This is, is this is another one of those semi-direct products that I mentioned yesterday, with now it has a different automorphism than the one I put up yesterday. All right. How do I know that that's true? Well, because here's my free group right here. And then what I do is I have an extra letter that's conjugating A and conjugating B to words in A and B. That's, that's exactly what a semi-direct product is. I'm kind of going backwards from where, what I did yesterday. Yesterday I taught you how to build one. Now I'm saying, oh, here it is. I recognize it as one because I gave it a presentation that looks like one. This is a semi-direct product where the automorphism is that A goes to AB and B goes to B, right? A gets, becomes AB under this conjugation action, and B goes to B, OK? And it turns out that group and this group are exactly the same group, OK? And how do I see that is I do it, what's called a TC transformation. If you haven't seen these before, I just do some cute little, oh, I just recognize this by changing the letters. That's why I didn't want to use a T up there, because I wanted a T right here. So if you look at this transformation, you identify z with a, and you identify x with t, and you identify y with bt. Then you can check that this group and that group are exactly the same. OK? And in other words, you just literally check that that when I replace those things that way, that's going to happen. In other words, that this bt plays the role of y up there, t plays the role of x, and a plays the role of z. You can change that presentation into this presentation. Okay. And part of the reason I'm, I want to say this is because yesterday I did another one of these semi-direct products with f2 and z, and it was very, very different. I looked at the presentation. I didn't see. You could try to build the presentation too complex. You can try to put a cat zero metric on it, but it's you're not going to see it. So I gave you another way to think about a space. That one I said, oh, wait a minute. OK, that's not working for me. But lo and behold, that's a three-manifold group. Whew. I recognize that. And then I know that there's some space it acts on. So that's another way of thinking about how to get the space from the group, is to play around with presentations and get a really cool presentation complex, or have some other knowledge of where that group came from. And maybe there's a natural space that it acts on. I want to say a little bit, one other thing about this one in terms of group theory is that this one looks like z. This is another kind of group theory construction. If you've heard of it, great. If you haven't, no big deal. It's called an HNN extension. So here I had an x, I had a y, and then what I did was do a z. It's a group theory construction, but you saw this in topology already if you've had a topology course. You know that what that algebra is meant to, I'm going to do it down here just because I can't reach that high. What that algebra is meant to do is, you're, so that, that z plus z with this z is meant to, to reflect some kind of topological thing. What you do is you take a torus. All right, there's my xy torus right there. And what I do to make an HNN extension, to, to make a space whose fundamental group is this algebra thing, is I take a tube and I take a cylinder that has fundamental group generated by z. And what I'm going to do is inject one end in one way. Let me do it like that. And I'm going to put this guy's going to wrap around x, and this guy's going to wrap around y. So I, that's how I'm going to glue that tube on. There's the x curve. And there's the y curve. And I glue one end of the cylinder to x, and I glue the other end to the curve y. That's a topology construction that's meant to mirror this group theory construction. In other words, this is a space so, that has fundamental group this. And if you want to think about it group theoretically, again, I kind of had to give you this, this, th that relation up there, the z inverse xz has to, be, it has to be equal to y, is exactly what this picture says. z 
I can think about it either way. I guess I probably drew my z in the wrong direction. Z inverse x, z is supposed to be y once I've glued it onto this group, uh, onto the, the torus. OK? Whereas this guy is something you've also seen in topology class. It's called a mapping torus. This is the mapping torus of that automorphism. OK? Trees are really different, but they're also two-dimensional cat zero, which means you can draw the pictures. All right, so that's pretty cool. All right, so I'm going to keep that up. I'm going to push that one up. OK. Yeah, that absolutely be not. Cat zero. Nope, yeah. not. In fact, horribly not. Most You're lucky if you get a presentation that whose presentation too complex is cat zero. Right. Like you're extremely lucky, right. right? It's rare, but it actually, so I gave you one example. And there's another way to think about why this group should work that has nothing to do with presentations, which I'll say in a minute when I give you another one like it. But also, there are times where it does work. So for example, if you take, if you take an alternating knot, all right, just for, if you don't know what that is, it doesn't matter. But for those of you who know what that is, this is how general this might be. If I take an alternating knot, and I look at a prime project, if, if I get a prime pro projection of that knot, I build what's called the Dane presentation. That's like standard knot theory stuff, right? It's just, you learn this by drawing all the little pictures over, under, over, under. And if it's a, if I look at an alternating prime projection of a knot, if I have one of those, I can write down a presentation from that, from that construction. And that presentation will have relators of length four. Now that alone does not mean that I'm a cat zero, that my presentation complex is cat zero, but it's a pretty good start, as you can see right here. It means I just have to check some combinatorial stuff. So if you look at how that algorithm for getting the presentation from the diagram works, what you'll see is that the link of every of the one vertex you care about, because it's again, it's the standard presentation complex, is a bipartite graph. This is easy, by the way, you do the knot theory. And then you get that. Um, off the bat means all circuits have even length. And all I have to do is rule out a circuit of size 2, because I just ruled out a circuit of size 3 by showing it's bipartite. And circuits of size 2, if I had one, it would mean the projection wasn't prime. So, so see what I'm saying is that sometimes there's entire families for which that procedure works. So that's kind of a cool, that's, it's not completely crazy, but if somebody hands you a group on the street, no doubt it's probably not going to work, right? Randomness. There we go. There's my randomness of the whole. That's the first time I've said the word group on the street. So I think I contributed to the randomness part. <laughs> Talking about groups on the street. All right. All right. So um, I want to do a non example too, but before I do my non examples, I want to say what the general, uh, a more general. I, I had to say it because I gave one example of it. So let's talk about non examples. And this is more for the point of view of how do I prove something is not cat zero? Well, I certainly can't go around checking every space. That doesn't work. So I have to have some conditions. All right. So we already saw some, in condi some conditions. So one kind of, I'm going to put this in quotes because this isn't always easy, but an easy check for showing a group is not cat zero. is its isoparametric inequality, all right? Cat zero groups have quadratic isoparametric inequality. I'm not going to prove that, but I'm going to tell you that you already know that must be true because the plane has isoparametric inequality, right? Loops of size n enclose an area of size basically n squared. And that property is actually invariant under quasi-isometry. So Isoparametric inequality is invariant under, under uh, quasi-isometry. So if the plane has it, so should every cat zero space. That's my plausibility argument. Right? That's not a proof by any stretch of the imagination. But that's the right idea. That's why it works. That's why we chose this notion of curvature. So that's an easy check. So if you have a group, that's the first thing you should check. Do I know it's isoparametric inequality? So the kinds of groups that rules out, of course, this rules out. Groups you've already seen this week, like the bombslag solitar group. You saw that group. It rules that out automatically. It also rules out the Heisenberg group. 
I'm going to just denote it like that because that had a cubic isoparametric inequality. It also rules out things like out Fn because that has an exponential isoparametric inequality. So it rules out a lot of groups right off the bat. You're not cat zero because you don't have the right isoparametric inequality. OK, but then there are lots and lots of groups that do have, have quadratic isoparametric inequality. So what about, I'll give two examples that do. So it turns out the mapping class group has, has quadratic isoparametric inequality. And so I'll just be real careful and say genus greater than or equal to 3 or genus 2 with one boundary component. You always have to put some of these on there because the, the low complexity cases are always a little bit different. OK? One boundary component. Um, and also, so those ones, that, that's like a whole industry of people. But that, to, to show those have, that, that has been proven that those have quadratic isoparametric inequality. There's probably more than one proof of that. But the one I know is Lee Mosier's proof that that has, well, for one, he puts an automatic structure on it. So that's even better. Um, it, has, uh, it has isoparametric inequality quadratic. And then these guys, these are the ones I want to think about. Because that's like a whole other planet, the mapping class group. That's a whole other set of friends that you could have in the math world. Right? That's like a group of people. So these guys are a little easier to understand because we've already been working with them. These, this was a really, uh, really great result of Brideson and Groves in a series of papers where they proved that all of them have quadratic isoparametric inequality. All of them. Okay? And they're very, very varied. Very varied. That's really hard to say. I'm going to write it because I didn't even say it right. Very varied. That's hard. Try saying that three times. All right. So what I've hopefully convinced you of is that for these ones, n equals 2, they're all cat 0. Now, I actually only gave you two, three examples. I gave you three examples, but it turns out those are the only three you have to worry about. So I gave you f2 cross z. So that's where the automorphism that determines it is the trivial one or an inner one. Turns out that's, or even a finite even a finite power of it. If a finite power of this guy is inner, remember I'm just picking an automorphism of the free group, then this is already up to finite index a direct product. And we know products work. So those are good. And then for F2, it turns out there's only really two types you have to worry about. And I've shown you both of them. The one like the figure 8 not complement, and the one that I just did over there today. Those are all of the semi-direct products of F2 and Z. OK? So what about when I go to F3? So here's our first example. Of course, everything, all hell breaks loose when you go to n equals 3 with free groups. Always, always, always. OK, so I'm going to write down a particular example and show you that it's not cat 0. And this was a really cool, very elementary observation um, by Steve Gersten a long time ago. But I remember when it came out, I was like, oh my gosh, that is like the coolest thing ever. All right, so here's the automorphism. It's going to take a to A, B goes to BA, and C goes to CA squared. Okay. So we have a presentation for this group. Again, it's a semi-direct product. So now I have a free group on three generators, and I have the extra conjugator guy, right? the extra conjugator. And so I already know what the presentation is. It takes T takes A to A. T takes B to BA. And let me make sure I'm doing them. Yep. You know what? I'm going to conjugate the other way this time, just because I did in my notes. It doesn't matter, as long as you're consistent. So, And then T, C, T inverse is CA squared. Right? We know that's a presentation, because that's how you build semi-direct products. All right. So notice that in here, this guy gives me a Z plus Z subgroup. Right, so this, the subgroup generated by A and T is a Z plus Z subgroup. That's good. Flats are good. Okay. Now I want to put up a theorem about what's wrong with this example. So again, it has quadratic isoparametric inequality. It's finitely presented. So the sort of the first few things you might check are okay. And so you have to look for some more subtle information. And the more subtle information is given to you in what's called the flat torus theorem.
Okay, so there's this is a generalization of a theorem from sort of classical Riemannian uh, geometry that Brightson proved for cat zero spaces. And I'm going to just state it like this. I'm not going to state it in all of its beautiful generality. You can look it up. But here's what I want to say is suppose gamma acts on x geometrically. So again, I'm in a cat zero group setting. And uh, A is a subgroup of gamma that is isomorphic to z to the n. So free abelian of rank n. So if I have a free abelian subgroup of rank n, then it's going to be undistorted, but in the nicest way possible. All right. So there exists an isometrically embedded plane. Sorry, not plane. Euclidean n space, if I have n's. Here I'm going to have a plane. Um, a Euclidean n space on which uh, A acts in the usual way with a torus quotient. So it acts geometrically. Right? It really gives me a geometric thing. I, honest to goodness, have a nice metric torus embedded in my quotient, or I can think about it this way. I can ignore the rest of the space, look at the action of A on this one plane, and it looks just like my normal Zn, you know, n linearly independent vectors, translation vectors acting on Rn, the standard setup. OK? I thought we just have the x. X is cat 0, sorry. Yeah. Cat 0 with the geometric group action. It turns out you can get away with less. You can actually just have it acting by semi-simple isometries. Mm -hmm. You actually don't need the full strength of co-compactness to get this theorem. And you can actually take this to be a virtually abelian. Like there's a much more general statement, virtually abelian, and then you can say a bit more. But this is the statement I want for this to, uh, to analyze this example. So that means over here, if that were cat 0, so if this group, I'll just call it gamma, so gamma, if that gamma were cat 0, then I'd have the following picture. I'd have a picture of a plane and I'd have A and T would be like two translation vectors acting on that plane, right? I can draw them like they're perpendicular, but they don't have to be perpendicular. So maybe I won't draw them like they're perpendicular. Maybe I'll just draw them like this. Here's T. I'll make one of them vertical, and then maybe A is like this. Right, maybe that's A. Right, so there's my A vector and my T vector. In other words, if I draw that out to be a whole line, then AX on that line by translation and TX by, this, by translation on that, leg, on that line. By some length. I don't know what length. But what I do know from the group theory is the following. Now I want to do a little bit of group theory over here. I'm going to change this relation, and I'm going to write it like this. I'm going to put the b over here and the t over here. b inverse t b equals a t. So all I did was move that over there and that over there. Okay, everybody okay with that relation? And I'm going to do I'm going to do the same thing over here. I'm going to put the c over here. So c inverse t c, and then I'm going to put the t inverse over there. OK? So what does that give me? Well, here's a fundamental fact about isometries of cat zero spaces, or isometries of pretty much any space, is that if I take an element and it has a translation length, OK? So this t has some translation length. Then any conjugate of that element is an isometry with the same translation length. It just has an axis somewhere else in the space. That's all, all right? So if I take a cos, so t has some translation length. Let me just call it, let me just write it like this. Now you could do an algebraic translation length, which I think you might have seen in Olga's talk when she ruled out bomb slog solitars from being in, in hyperbolic groups. That's the standard argument. But really now I'm just thinking about isometries. And this is a translation on an axis in a plane. This is like seventh grade Euclidean geometry. And then what I'm saying is, in this bigger cat zero space, if I take a conjugate of t, it acts on an axis somewhere with the same exact translation length. Right? But here's a conjugate of t right here. But it actually equals this element in the group. So that means whatever the translation length is of this, it has to be the same as t. All right? So that means this one's equal to at. 
oh wow, that AT happens to be an element also in this free abelian group too, right? So keep that in mind. And the same thing is true here. There's A squared T. But let's think about what that looks like. So what does that look like? That means when I draw A T, remember that just means put A on the top of T and then draw this arrow, right? And then if I do T A squared, it means just put another one. And there's T A squared, just like that guy, that little vector, right? But all three of those are, all, th these three points right here lie on a line, the same line, right? But yet they're all exactly the same distance away from the origin because they, have all, they all have the same length, right? In other words, this green, this green, and this blue all have the same length. But how can a line intersect a circle in three points in the plane? That's something I, even I remember from Euclidean geometry. You can't have a line that intersects a circle in three points, right? So this can't happen. So I can't draw a faithful picture of it because one doesn't exist. That's the problem. I can write out the algebra and see that this can't happen. I can't have those three vectors. They're all the same length, yet they all lie on the same line, right? So this can't happen. That's very, very subtle information that the group gives you. This can't happen in R2. One line cannot intersect a circle in three points. All right, that's pretty subtle information that you don't get unless you look a little bit further. All right, I want to give one more non-example in my last few minutes or at least mention it. Before I say my final remarks about these, well, maybe I'll say the final remarks about the semi-direct products of f, of f, n, and z, because now I've mentioned them. So this, was, this is a really cool first non-example. Um, and it turns out that uh, there was a student of Danny Groves years ago who wrote up a nice generalization of this example, who looked at semi-direct products of f, n, and z, and sort of said, well, you can make this proof work with the following conditions. So that's a, a really nice, I, I think he was an undergraduate when he wrote it. His last name is Samuelson. And it's a nice paper to sort of say, oh, how general is this argument? Like, what kinds of automorphisms does this argument work for? That's what his paper's about. He sort of generalizes and says, if you, have, if you can avoid this behavior, then you won't have this problem, OK? But the question of which Fn semi-direct z's are cat 0 or not, not answered, or which ones are biautomatic, which ones are semi-hyperbolic, these are the test case for any possible conjecture you might have. They are the potential counterexamples for every single question in geometric group theory. If somebody says, oh, do you know of a group that does this or that? My very first thought is there must, or if there is, it's a semi-direct product of Fn and z. They are seemingly simple because I describe them in a really simple way of, oh, all I need is an automorphism. Well, that right there already takes you out into some crazy world, right? Oh, I just need an automorphism of a free group, right? That sounds easy. But once, when you pick that, you get some really, you, by cho choosing that in a particular way, you get some really cool behavior or some crazy behavior, right? So there are, you can look and see when, it, when do I get a hyperbolic group? When do I get a cat zero group? When do I get... They're all sort of non-positively curved in some sense because they have quadratic isoparametric inequality. That's what makes them so delicate. You can't rule out any of these things by their quadratic isoparametric, uh, by their isoparametric inequality. So for, it's kind of a plug for, if you're looking for a class of groups to study, those are some good ones. And then the final example I wanted to mention, just because it brings up another thing like this, so this is a nice way to check whether you're you know, this is a bad z plus z inside of your group. That's something you can check for. Somebody hands you a group. Can it act on a cat zero space? Well, do I have any weird free abelian subgroups that are not in there in the right way? This, that's exactly what this one is. And then the last one is the mapping class group. I'm just going to say this. Um, so the way in which you prove the mapping class groups are not cat zero is by another, um, another thing that you can check. So again, it's different than the flat torus theorem. So gamma acts geometrically on a cat zero space again. Same conditions. And then pick some infinite order gamma.
then what's true, then this, first of all, there's two things that are true. First of all, the centralizer of gamma is, again, a cat zero group. So we've already seen that phenomenon a couple times, that if I take a hyperbolic group and I look at an infinite order element, well, it determines a quasi-convex subgroup, and its centralizer is only a little finite bit bigger than that. So we already saw that that guy's already a word hyperbolic group. The same thing was true for semi-hyperbolic groups. If I take an infinite order element and I look at its centralizer, I told you it's naturally semi-hyperbolic because it inherits something from the structure. I didn't go through the details, but it's a theme. Centralizers are smaller versions of the group inside of the group. That's the point I want to make. And the same thing is true here. This acts geometrically on a convex subset y inside of x. OK? And in fact, that y is really nice. It's isometric to something of this form. Now that's a geometry statement, and now I'm about to put an algebra statement. All right? And what comes out of that is that there exists a finite index subgroup, h, inside of the centralizer, such that h looks like some uh, k cross gamma. So I'll say that in the, the usual language of geometric group theory is that the centralizer virtually splits off the element as a direct factor. That's, so up to finite index, the centralizer is the gamma cross some other cat zero group. OK? And in fact, you can prove this k acts geometrically on the z. So you get this really, really nice structure in, for centralizers. But group theoretically, it means the centralizer has to split off the element as a virtual direct factor. And that's a really, really helpful way of showing some groups cannot be cat zero. So the mapping class group has that, has that property. That's how you can prove the mapping class group cannot be a cat zero group. You can just look, say, oh, I have a surface. And I know I can be, if it's high enough complexity, then I can find a Dane twist whose centralizer does not look like this. It's literally that simple. That's how the proof goes. Well, it's not simple. You've got to know some, you gotta know some theory. But you can prove that the centralizer of a, of a very particular Dane twist cannot look like this. It, it looks like a central extension, but it doesn't split. So that shows that that's not cat zero. So those are two very powerful things to know about cat zero groups that can rule out a group from being cat zero. And look at me. I'm going to end with 18 seconds to go.